But who fails to contain here, I think, are not the blemies, the satyrs, or the goat pants, but rather the choreographer himself. His curt and concise syntax attempts to mirror the job of what the terrae continentes of medieval Latin and our modern continents would later try to do, namely to contain, to hold together lands which should be in turn subdivided into regions. On the one hand, this is but the epistemological version of the act of dividing and ordering land and conquering people, a sort of divided impera of the intellectual geographer who was anticipated in this choreographic enterprise by none other than Emperor Augustus, himself the author of a lost choreographia. On the other hand, however, this is nothing more than a gesture for Mela, a gesture that the choreographia may even mock, as it quickly becomes clear that the continents, regions, and peoples of these treaties eventually failed to be contained, or maybe they weren't meant to be contained from their very inception. Never mind that Africa will return in book three of the choreographia, featuring then at the very close of the work and thus drawing a circle around the whole treatise. What we get for now in this brusque formulation is a clear delimitation of geographical, so material as well as textual conceptual space. The following word, Asiae, seems to imply that we have turned the page and our minds into a wholly different realm of the imagination. But have we? The first part of Asia that Mela goes on to describe is nothing other than Egypt, that is a contested land at best, straddling both Asia and Africa, and one which lays bare the treatise's problematic boundaries because the border between Africa and Asia is variously placed by Mela in Cyrenaica, at the Nile, or even at Alexandria. Mela's imaginary African geography is, of course, no isolated text. Some of the creatures or people that he mentions can even be traced back to Herodotus, this is in your handout too, who places them next to the Libyan agricultural tribes on the west side of the river Triton of dubious identification, but likely not too far from the lesser Certes in a territory that Herodotus writes is full of bushes and beasts. Herodotus's narrative trajectory is meant here to elicit surprise and wonder. After the enormous snakes, Herodotus mentions a few normal animals, lions, elephants, bears, asps, horned asses, and then almost en passant, he mentions the dog heads, oikinokephaloi, and the headless, oikinokephaloi. If the dog heads can pass the test of his reader's suspension of belief, the headless are felt to need further specification. So Herodotus writes that they, they are those who have their eyes in their chests. Anticipating his reader's questioning, Herodotus is then quick to cast responsibility for this information upon the Libyans themselves. Os de legontaige que polybion, he says, before closing his short catalog of wild men and women, hoia groandres kai gunaikes, whose mention confirms our suspicion that the dog heads and the headless may have been human after all. Herodotus's attribution of these rumors to the indigenous Libyans is telling of his disavowal of, this, of historical responsibility, but he may also point us towards the existence of a kind of racecraft among African people themselves. This aspect of the narrative disappears in Mela and Pliny the Elder, who instead incorporate these creatures or people into a tradition of Greco-Roman ethnography, so partly Phoenician ethnography. <clears throat> in both Mela and Pliny, the headless have been merged with the historical Blemius, a people that Strabo identified as subject to the Ethiopians um, and bordering Egypt, but whom Pliny, and this is the long passage in your handout three, places instead in the desert, in solitudinibus, next to the Atlantis, together with the half-bestial goat pans, the gamphasantes, the satyrs, the himantopodas, who are leader like snakes instead of walking. As Evans remarks, African, Africa's empty landscapes that are stressed more than once in this passage by Pliny, so you can see intervenientibus desertis, or wastae solitudines, <laughs> these empty landscapes for Evans develop uh, what she calls a blank canvas for the representation of monstrous people. Africa becomes, and I'm still quoting Evans, a stage for playing out fears about the unexplored reaches of the third continent. It is the counter world of our world, the mirror of the oikumene, end quote. 
But I think we can also complicate the matter by noticing how Pliny presents West Africa, where these marvelous people live, as an inverted mirror for Egypt instead a land which was in turn perhaps taken as an inverted mirror for Greek cultural practice, at least since Herodotus. Indeed, the river Niger, which we may or may not be able to identify with the homonymous West African river extending from Guinea through Mali, Niger and Nigeria, is presented here as a veritable anti-Nile. So the river has this, the Nile's same nature, Eadem Natura Quae Nilo, it produces reeds and papyrus and the same animals and it rises at the same seasons of the year. This African geography of the West, even in comparison to the already wondrous geography of the Nile, is one to elicit the reader's suspension of belief. The same is true for Pliny's attribution of marvelous and monstrous traits to the Western Ethiopians. While the distinction between Eastern and Western Ethiopians has an Herodotian and even Homeric pedigree, this dehumanization of the Western Ethiopians seems to surface only in the Roman sources. So again, this Africa of Pliny, and this is a passage in your handout for, is a desert for the Roman imagination of the marvelous. And as such, it can be filled by Cyclopic people, whose king is said to have only one eye, people such as the Kinamolgi, the dog milkers, whom Diodorus described uh, as breeders of fierce dogs, but Pliny has here transformed into another race of dog heads, Caninis capitibus, the four-legged Artabatitae who roam around like beasts, as well as people described by their strange diets, the Agriophagi, these are the wild beast eaters who feed themselves of panthers and lions, the locust eaters, the Pamphagi or Ito, and the Anthropophagi, the cannibals. Tamela and Pliny are not the only Roman authors to express the unknowability of Africa through the fictional dehumanization of its inhabitants and the indeterminacy of its geography. The question of Africa's borders surfaces continuously in Greco-Roman literature, often in tandem with the controversy over the division of the earth into two or three continents, partes in Latin or moria in Greek. And the choice adopted can betray no small ideological dimension. While the trapartite division of the Oikumene seems to be the official line adopted at Rome from Emperor Augustus onwards, imperial epic poetry has its good reasons at times for stre stressing bipartite divisions instead. So if you see your handout five, for instance, Sidius Italicus is Punica, which must stage a relatively straightforward opposition between Romans against African Semitic, so African Asiatic Carthaginians, can entertain the notion of Libya being a huge flank of Asia or else a third part of the world. On the other hand, his predecessor Lucan, um, when preparing to present his Africa, as we will see, as a sort of frugal anti-Rome against which to test the incorruptibility of Cato, assigns the tripartite division of the world to nothing more than as unsubstantiated rumor, and he stresses autoptic reality in making it part of Europe instead. So Lucan writes, Libya is the third part of the world, if you wish to trust hearsay in all things, but if you follow the winds and the sky, you will find instead that it is a part of Europe. In doing so, Lucan is picking up a suggestion from Salus Bellum Iogurtinum that is another work that had much to gain in portraying Numidians in a mirroring contiguity with the corrupted Roman aristocracy, while at the same time casting them in their genealogy as the Persians of the South. This indeterminacy of geography maps onto the indeterminate portrayal of the people and creatures who inhabit Africa in these works following, at least in parts, the tenets of environmental determinism. So in authors such as Sallust and Lucan, for instance, Libya's shifting and ambiguous landscape, especially descriptions of the Sirtis or of sandstorms, anticipate the hidden and animalistic ambushes of characters such as Jugurta or Juba. And I've previously written about how the unexpected lustful vegetation that Virgil's Aeneas finds on the coasts of modern day Tunisia has been thought to symbolically anticipate the feminization of Dido's city as a fertile landscape for proto Roman conquest. And where the landscape becomes inhospitable and unknown, there is the opportunity not only for geographers such as Mela and Pliny, but also for epicists such as Silius and Lucan, following the footsteps of Apollonius of Rhodes, 
to introduce marbles who partake of the animal as much as the human domain, but which are firmly anchored to the territory with Libya, Africa functioning then as a veritable <clears throat> hypothesis of the primeval earth. So the project that I've just begun to work on starts from the hypothesis that these fictional representations of African lands and people in Latin literary texts, as well as the instrumental divisions of African borders and territories, allow us to see a sort of prehistory of what Congolese philosopher Valentini Mudimbe has called the invention of Africa as defined according to European structures of thought and of the imagination. Of course, for history, it kind of makes little sense given our historically post-colonial stance as readers of these texts. But still, post-coloniality may allow us to delve into similarities that we can imagine as betraying some sort of continuity. Mela's choreographia and Pliny's geography of African monstrosities will feed into the medieval bestiaries and up into the early modern European constructions of the continent. In view of the role that these texts likely played in the cultural history of colonialism, we may be justified in labeling them as pre or proto colonial. Mela's text was rediscovered in France and brought to a larger public by Petrarch, himself engaged, as I understand you heard about last week, in his own invention of Africa with his unfinished epic on the Hannibalic War. A copy of the Corografia was also owned and annotated extensively by Portuguese captain Pedro Alvarez Cabral, who landed on the coast of Brazil in 1500, and Mela was translated into Castilian by his accompanying astronomer, Joao Faraz. Both Roman ethnographers, such as Strabo and Pliny, and the Latin epicists will also serve as models in Gomez Eanes de Zurara's 1453 Cronica do Descobrimento a Conquista de Guinea, which is one of the first texts to justify scientific racism and the transatlantic slave trade. We can also detect in Roman texts, I think, what Thomas Hodgkin recognized as the two contradictory European myths about Africa. So on the one hand, what he calls the Hobbesian myth of an inhospitable land lacking in society and art, whose main characteristic is the risk of violent death. On the other hand, the Rousseauian picture of an African golden age of perfect liberty, equality, and fraternity. This double picture resonates, um, as I hopefully am going to show, in the portrayal of Africa in Lucan. On the one hand, Lucan shows us a barren, violent, inhospitable land, but on the other, this is also an uncorrupted landscape where Cato can test his virtue and the virtue of his soldiers with the potential to recover a lost golden age for the corrupted Rome of the late, um, of the late Republic. For the remainder of this paper, um, then, I'd like to focus on two authors, Lucan and Seneca, who seem to present a view of Africa broadly comparable um, to what we've seen in Mela and, and later in Pliny, without necessarily engaging in the suggestion that Mela may have been in some way related to Seneca and Lucan, which is, however, a possibility that we may cannot rule out. In particular, I'm, I'm interested in seeing how all these authors seem to present um, a neat separation between Africa and Egypt, as well as a conceptualization of Africa as a threshold to test the limits of the human. I also believe that there may be good reasons for such conceptualizations of Africa to emerge, especially under Nero, at a time of potential instability for the relatively brand new principate, where the risk of civil war was always at the door and the borders of the Roman Empire could function symbolically as thresholds of containment for the unity and stability of an idea of Roman nation. Africa is presented here not, or not just at least, as a place for Roman conquest, but as a veritable landscape of allegory that allows a redefinition of the Roman from a place of utmost alterity. So starting with, with Lucan, Lucan's African landscape, uh, in, especially in Bellum Kiwile 9, showcases its own generic liaison with the ethnographic tradition and also displays various signs of its subordination to the Roman imagination. Libya is, in the words of um, unnamed Roman soldiers, this is in your handout six, a monster breeding world. She's the mother of the giant Antius and of the desert snakes, which, Lucan writes, nature herself had decided to snatch away from the people and give back to the serpents. 
Both in Lucan and in Silius, the Roman encounter with the African territory entails a blurring of the boundaries between human, animal, and natural realms. The river Bagrada, that is the modern Megerda flowing from Algeria through Tunisia, were Lucan's Furio lands in Balunkiwile IV, and where Silius's Marus recounts that Regulus met the African serpent, is presented in both texts as a sort of river snake, slowly furrowing the dry sands. So Lucan writes, Bagrada lentus agit sit hae sulcator arena in Silius, uh, turbidus arentes lentopede sulcat arenas Bagrada. And Silius also makes the Bagrada the name of an African commander. As a hero of Sallust, uh, Jugurtha's guile and ambushing tactics, Lucan's Juba sets traps to his enemies like the African Mongols tricks the snakes by provoking uncertain shadows in the desert with his tail. In this land, the Romans too seem to mingle with the animal realm, first by embodies the victims of the Mongols, the Egyptian snakes, then by having their slaughter filtered through a long description of the agony of their horses, until the Roman soldiers become nothing more than packed limbs, stipata membra, in their final slaughter. If the Romans are the snake victims of the Mongols in Bellum Kiwile IV, they are almost wiped out by the snakes in Bellum Kiwile IX. Following their march through the snake-infested desert, the Romans themselves define this tract of earth, which they fashion at the very edges of Africa, as an Antipodean land which lies almost outside the globe. This is in your handout seven. They say, imus in adversus access a wall we would orbe. It is here that we find one people, uh, the Psyli, and I've written more in depth about this elsewhere, but just to give you an idea, um, the Psyli, whose characteristic bodily feature is unavailable to the human eye, but is something that makes them marvelous because their blood is immune to any kind of poison, and their ability to heal from deadly venom turns them into a magic medical people. They're defined as magica gens. Uh, Lucan's placing of the psyllae in Marmarica, he calls them Marmaridae psyllae, uh, which is between Egypt and Cyrenaica, is both unprecedented and disorienting in terms of the Romans wrote in both nine. So th this is a kind of a problem in the text. In Herodotus II, um, and this is on page four, the psyllae um, are a rather mysterious tribe with their existence negated by the histories as soon as it is affirmed. So Herodotus claimed that they are a Z neighbors to the Nasamones, but then he says that they have all perished ex apolosi because they were all buried in the desert by the wind when they were marching to look for water. Again, this is another story supposedly recounted by the Libyans, perhaps by the Nasamones themselves, who may have been the ones to wipe them out. That the Psyllae were perceived as half bestial or marvelous by the Romans may be confirmed by Strabo, who possibly identifies as a Psyllus, the originator of the Ophiogenes, saying that he was originally a serpent who had metamorphosed into a man. The Psyllae's healing magic recomposes the wounds of Cato's Republican army, and at the same time cuts and rounds off Lucan's Libyan digression at the edges of the known world. The Psyllae are as far as Lucan goes in terms of marvelous African people, and we may argue that, just like the rest of Lucan's African digression, they eventually serve the purpose of taste testing and, in this case, recomposing what is left of the Republican forces. The peculiarity of their bodies is not only uh, not attributable to deformity, but it consists in an unseen internal quality that actually allows them to reshape and recompose the now deformed, wrecked and wounded bodies of the Romans into their pristine formae. In this sense, they are the literary heirs to Virgil's Iapix, the doctor who heals Aeneas's body in the last book of the Aeneid and recomposes it in what is described as an almost magical and miraculous way. The healing psyllae are the tales of a narrative that had opened with the shifting, treacherous, and still unformed landscape of the Syrtis in your handout eight. Uh, the Syrtis, which Lucan described as being left in Kuwait by nature, somewhere between the land and the sea. 
this malleable quality of the African soil reappears also in Lucan's description of the sandstorm, where the movable sandy surface of the African land makes it so that the violent winds provoke a continuous quicksand on the surface level, although the earth is safe from earthquakes that would tear away its core. The barrenness, harshness and shapelessness of this African landscape has been read by many scholars as marking this geography of imagination as a kind of black canvas onto which to test and reflect upon Cato's stoicism. This is in your handout nine. Already Seneca in episode 104, which we became particularly famous yesterday, um, not this bit though, had used the dryness of Africa to exemplify Cato's enduring virtue and had already turned it into what Machili called a landscape of allegory. While well, Lucan admits that some parts of Libya in the West are fertile, um, overall he conveys the implausible picture of a land with no rivers, and this is a fiction which was vehemently denied by Strabo. This fictional landscape also shapes the character of its indigenous inhabitants according to the tenets of environmental determinism. As Cicero already said of the Carthaginian uh, in your handout 10, what makes them untrustworthy is not their ancestry, but their geography. <clears throat> the same is true of the Numidians, which Lucan in book four pairs with the Carthaginians in terms of untrustworthiness. He talks about Libicus, Libicus fraudes, um, with the shifting landscape of Africa being reflected uh, both in their wandering nomadic nature, that he calls them numidae wagi, numidae fugaces, and in their fecal disposition. Already Sallust uh, said uh, of the Numidians that they were a genus in fidum, um, in genio mobili. In Bellum Kiwile 9, the harshness and barrenness on the landscape on the other side is also reflected in the hardiness and lack of means of the Nasamones in your handout 11, who feature here as a hardy and naked race, dura, uh, nudus. Um, and their inopia, as specified in book four, inops Nasamon, is here translated also into the territory's lack of riches, lack of opus that may cause the land to become both violated by the Romans and itself corrupted. <clears throat> this landscape of allegory, where the hardiness of the Nazamones also anticipates and reflects the stoic hard virtue of Cato, dura virtus, continues in the imaginary landscape of the Garamantes and their territory, where Lucan twists both the nature of the Garamantes and African geography here in order to test Cato's resistance to the oracle of Jupiter Ammon, proving his distance from the model of Alexander the Great that had instead plagued both Pompey and Caesar. Uh, the major geographical inconsistency here is Lucan's insertion of the oracle located in the oasis of Siwa um, in current Egypt towards the border with Libya in the territory instead of the Garamantes, which would be in Fezans, like central Libya. It could be that the association was provided by the figure of King Hyarbas in the Aeneid, who was described by Virgil as son of Jupiter Ammon and a Garamantian nymph. So it, joined Ammon and the Garamantes. But Lucan here also paints a picture of the Garamantes as no, a nomadic people, which actually goes, goes against both Herodotus's account of the Garamantes as a people who practiced agriculture and Lucan's own account in book four, where he claimed that the Garamantes cultivated the lands naked. In Bellum Kiwile 9, the Garamantes uh, joined the Nasamones in having their dwellings subject to constant ruin by the sandstorms, and they are specified as inculti, a term which literally and traditionally refers to their nomadic existence and to their lack of agricultural skills, but which we can see here in Lucan as also assuming a wider moral significance in the lack of decor that characterizes the pristine and uncorrupted existence of Jupiter Ammon, which is the last bastion of resistance to the corrupting influence of Roman gold. So this very swift account of Lucan's Imagine Africa um, shows Africa, um, I hope, as hanging between a picture of animalistic monstrosity and violence and an, an anticipation of the European myth of the good savage. In order to obtain both effects, Lucan feels free to twist the coordinates of African geography 
change the characteristics of its inhabitants and overall present the land as almost <clears throat> inchoate and malleable, ready to be molded by the Roman literary imagination. So I turn now to a very final historiographical anecdote that is presented instead by Lucan's uncle, and which I believe offers many points in common with the landscape of Africa that is exposed in the Bell of Kiwile. Now, this is a rather short passage from Seneca's Natural Questions that recounts an expedition ordered by Nero to Africa to retrieve the mystery of the sources of the Nile. Well, Seneca's purpose in this passage is supposedly of a natural scientific kind, namely uh, Seneca wants to demonstrate the existence of underground rivers for the larger purpose of explaining the causes of earthquakes. The passage is extremely telling in terms of both Nero's, uh, Nero's expansionist politics and of Seneca's use of geographical imagination to expose the limitations and yet the necessities of such politics for the existence of a Roman Empire. So in this passage, I argue, Africa appears as a sort of threshold of death for the Romans, but if such close encounter with death would temper the virtue of a character like Cato, in the case of Nero and his scientific knowledge, thirst for knowledge, Africa functions instead as a veritable mirror for a hubristic ambition that can only be satiated by its own self-deception. So shortly in the sixth book of Naturales Questiones, for the purpose of proving to Lucilius the existence of subterranean rivers, this is in your handout 12, and of a hidden sea, Seneca inserts an anecdote that is almost eavesdrop rather than narrated to him directly about two centurions who were sent by Nero to Ethiopia to investigate the sources of the Nile and who successfully reported back. This is at the beginning of page six, so I'm gonna read the passage in English. In fact, writes Seneca, I heard two centurions who were sent to investigate the source of the Nile by Caesar and Nero, lover of all virtues, really, but more than anything, lover of the truth. They were narrating of the long journey that they made when, after receiving help from the king of Ethiopia and being recommended to the neighboring kings, they penetrated to even more distant regions. After many days, they said, we came to immense swamps the way out of which neither their dwellers knew, nor can anyone hope to know. The plants are so entangled in the waters, and the waters are so impossible to conquer, either on foot or by navigation, that this muddy and overgrown swamp cannot carry anything except a small boat, large enough for one. Here, one of them said, we saw two rocks, out of which came the powerful force of the river. The historicity of the anecdote seems to be confirmed by a parallel passage of Pliny's natural history, which has, however, significant alterations. <clears throat> Most evidently, Pliny speaks of a party of Praetorian troops under the command of a tribune whose exploration was ordered by an already warmongering emperor in his wish to add a war against Ethiopia to his fields of battle. So Pliny writes, Interrelli qua bella et aetiopicum bellum cogitanti. In an ostensibly flattering move towards Nero, Seneca attributes the causes of the expedition to the princeps' love for truth, one of his many virtues. Utaliarum virtutum ita veritatis in primis amantissimus, writes Seneca. And in so doing, he ends up revealing an underlying connection between his Caesar and Julius Caesar, as portrayed by Lucan in Bellum Civile 10, uh, in your handout 13 where Julius Caesar talks uh, of himself to the Egyptian priest Acorios as someone who possesses such great virtue, tanta virtus, and such great love for truth, tantus amor veri, to feel compelled to find out the truth about the sources of the Nile. The desires that push Nero to send the exploring party in Seneca's and in Pliny's accounts have appeared to some scholars as irreconcilable, so much so that some have posited an anti-Neronian vein in Pliny to counterpose to Seneca's writing. But the accounts don't really need to be viewed as mutually exclusive. Indeed, the parallels between Seneca's Nero and Lucan's Caesar show that thirst for knowledge and warmongering can often be aligned, all the more so when such knowledge involves exploring territories that lie beyond one's domain. Lucan Caesar claims that he would even relinquish civil war if he was allowed to set his eyes on the sources of the Nile. 
far from being a pacifist statement, Caesar's words imply that epistemic power over the mysteries of Africa, a colonial conquest of sorts, would lead him astray from the comparatively irrelevant battles that he has been fighting at home. After all, the hubristic paradigm for this epistemic achievement is none other than the most famous conqueror of all, Alexander the Great. In the same book of Naturales Questiones, Alexander later features in his ruthless murder of the scientific philosopher Callisthenes, this is in your handout 14, who was imprisoned and killed for refusing to submit to the rage of this king. No matter how numerous and substantial Alexander's virtues, Seneca takes pain to specify that this is the one eternal crime, crimen aeternum, that no virtue, nulla virtus, and no success in war, nulla bellorum felicitas, will ever redeem. This contiguity of virtue and success in war in the sentence should at least make us reflect again about the role played by Nero's virtue and his love for truth in the Nilotic expedition, which is an enterprise of conquest, albeit not, or not yet, at least, of an openly military kind. This is also laid bare by the role played by the Ethiopians in Seneca's excerpt. Pliny's text specifies that this territory is up for grabs for Roman imperial conquest. He says, intravere autem et eo arma romana, at least since the times of Augustus, who also bragged about the Ethiopian campaign in his res gestae. And Pliny goes on to mention some of the conquests made by the prefect of Egypt, Petronius, as he retaliated against the locals' rebellion to Rome. Interestingly, Pliny's passage on the Nilotic expedition opens precisely by presenting this portion of Africa as a theater of war, as almost all the places that he had mentioned in the previous sections have been reported by the Neronian party to be nothing but desert, Certe solitudines, they say. In Seneca, this military context is missing. The Africans <clears throat> are presented as pacified or at least on friendly terms with the Romans. The centurions appears to have received help from the king of Ethiopia, whom we may take to mean the king of Meroe, which would be another incongruity with Pliny, who later specifies that Meroe at the time was being ruled by Queen Kandake. And Seneca writes that this king happened to also recommend them to the neighboring rulers. But the centurion's superior attitude towards the local inhabitants of this strait of land is betrayed when they start expressing themselves in direct speech. So I'm going to read it again. They say, we came to immense swamps, the way out of which neither their dwellers knew, nor can anyone hope to know. Per venimus ad immensas paludes, quarum exitum nec incola inoverant, nec sperare quisquam potest. The text seems to present an ambiguity here. On the surface of it, the centurions exaggerate the, the labyrinthic quality of the swamps by implying that nobody, not even the inhabitants, can even hope to know to find the way out of them. This is in line with the rhetorical tone of Seneca's passage, which casts the centurions' approach to what they take to be the sources of the Nile in full epic coloring. Emphasis is added by the sudden dramatic shift to direct speech, opening with a verb, peruenimus, whose tense must be perfect because it's uh, in symmetry with vidimus further down. But in prose, it may also be mistaken for a present, so furnishing the passage with a very dynamic, dramatic effect. The centurions further use Virgilian adjectives of size, of the kind meant to elicit sublime feeling, immensas, ingens, as well as rare and poetic vocabulary, such as the hapax legomenon, eluctabiles, or the rare and almost poetic absolute use of the participle obsita, that is normally accompanied by an ablative. For Arturo de Vivo, the centurion's linguistic novelty has a specific goal of building up what he calls a semantic of the unknown. Yet we may add that the scene also seems to be especially evocative of the Virgilian descent to Avernus, presumably another proof of the existence of subterranean lakes and rivers, and itself symbolized at the start of Aeneid VI by the image of the labyrinth. The journey takes Aeneas and the Sibyl through an immense silva down to the Stygian palus, the Stygian swamp, where the way in is easy, but the way out is almost impossibly arduous. The centurion's notation that no one may even hope to know the way out of this swamp is part of their picturing of the journey as a heroic descent to hell. 
And yet, since the centurions clearly did find the way out of the swamp, the passage may also be constructed as if to say that none of the indigenous inhabitants knows the way out, nor can anyone of them uh, ever hope to find it. It may be the locals here were portrayed in their complete lack of epistemic power, inhabitants of land whose mysteries they do not know, nor will they ever even have the potential to know. They are akin to the ignorant prisoners of Plato's cave, or portrayed in Virgilian terms as the ghost shadows of a hellish territory at the edges of the known world, one that lies in between earth and water, overground and underground, life and death. Of course, this portrait of the helpless natives is presented by the centurions, not by, the, by Seneca himself. Seneca, in turn, seems to cloud the centurions' epic journey in irony, given that the mystery that they think they have discovered at the end of their journey may not even be the sources of denial, as Seneca goes on to tell Musaius in your handout 15. He says, but whether that is the source of denial or only an addition to it, whether it is born there or merely returns to the surface after previously being taken underground, don't you think that, whatever that is, that water ascends from a great underground lake? In truth, Seneca seems completely uninterested in the whole business of finding the origin of the Nile. The point is that scientific phenomena are not always discernible by the human eye. It is in turn the centurions and the Caesars before them, both Nero and Julius and Alexander as their model, who are akin to the ignorant man inside the platonic cave, who are confusing scientific and philosophical knowledge with the autoptic experience of the military commander. In this passage of Naturales Questiones, Africa features as a land whose desert landscapes and unknowing inhabitants make it possible for the philosopher to exploit as a sort of blank slate onto which to test and project Roman virtue and vice in equal measures. While some historians have suggested that the passage may be located in the vast South Sudanese swamp known as the Sud from the Arabic Sad, that is a barrier or obstruction, the two rocks from which the centurions believe to have witnessed the source of the Nile um, seem instead really close to the description of the so-called veins of the Nile around Philae in the fourth book of the Natural Questions. These are in your handout 16. And so they end up casting doubt again on the reliability of this account. The veins of the Nile are duos scopuli, ex quibus magna, vis funditus. So it's very similar to the passage. Even more interestingly, as noticed also by Mauro Denardis, the limosa et obsita palus uh, of this passage may have been on the whole rather reminiscent of the marshes around the Nile as described by Seneca in his lost treatise on the geography and on the sacred rites of the Egyptians, the situ et de sacris Egyptiorum. Indeed, Servius is reminded of this work by Seneca when commenting precisely on the Stygian marshes of the Virgilian underworld. This is handout 17. And Servius finds the original Stygian swamp again around Philae, presented by Seneca as difficult to traverse, quam transitu constat esse difficilem, because of being muddy and overgrown with papyrus, limosa et papyrus refecta. There is therefore a direct triangulation between this description of a swamp at the very edge of the known world, the waters around Philae, and the underworld marsh of the Styx, where the shadows of the dead converge. And yet it has also long been recognized that in Naturales Questiones for a uh, 2 3, which is your handout 18, Seneca seems to confuse Philae, that, was lo that is located just above the first cataract, with the region of Meroe instead. So the description seems to be the description of Meroe that is located farther down between the fifth and the sixth cataracts. Um, and this is a mistake that is all the more startling given the incongruity with Lucan's parallel account um, in Bellum Kiwile 10. Seneca's oversight, or rather perhaps conscious adjustment of geography here, may be comparable to the geographical mistakes made by Lucan, as we have seen in relation to the Psyli or the Oracle of Jupiter Ammon, and it may well have here a rhetorical effect. Gareth Williams uh, comments on the suitability of having the speaking place of friendship and reconciliation, philae that he translates as amicae, uh, Seneca, as the symbolic border between Egypt and Africa, as well as a symbolic cradle of civilization. 
the name is also reminiscent of another symbolic border between Greek and Punic Africa that was marked by the devotio of two Carthaginian brothers, the brothers Philaeni, who sacrificed themselves for their nation, as narrated by Sallust in a poignant excursus of the Bell of Gibertino. For Seneca, this recollection at Philae, where the Nile recoils after having traveled through great wastelands and having spread out, out into swamps, magnas solitudines per vagatus et impaludes diffusus, um, creates uh, a direct opposition, I think, between the last portion of Egypt and neighboring Ethiopia, where the Nile continues his course next, as he goes on to say, abhac nilus magnus magis quam violentus a Ethiopiam. Um, etc. Uh, the Naturales Questiones had already imposed a clear boundary between Egypt and Ethiopia. Um, Ethiopia had already been presented as a land of dry deserts. This is handout 19, Siccas Solitudines, with very few springs and an ardent weather. Seneca had portrayed the region as a, as a desert landscape, also indulging in a kind of pathetic fallacy when describing its lands it stands as lying abandoned and thirsty, quick to drink from any little water that they may receive from the sky. And it is also for this reason that Seneca also says that he believes that one must reject Anaxagoras' theory that the Nile originates from the melting of the snow on the peaks of Ethiopia. He says there is no snow in Ethiopia. So to conclude, Seneca needs Ethiopia and Africa, I think, as a land separate from Egypt, whose very barrenness and hostility to humankind can test the limits and endurance of Roman military virtue and thirst for knowledge. In this respect, Seneca's use of Africa comes very close to that of Lucan, um, who exploited the barrenness, harshness, and shapelessness of Africa to test and reflect upon Cato's Stoicism in an epic rendering that, as we have seen, is very much in line with Seneca's own use of Africa in his Epistle 104. Presented as an almost upside down, hellish version of the fertility and civilization of Egypt, Africa in the natural questions becomes the geographical and epistemological threshold that both Nero and Seneca need to sustain the aggressive thirst for conquest of a nation that is at risk of imploding if it doesn't engage in a continuous renegotiations of its borders and its empires of knowledge. So I've argued that in my project, I entertain the idea that these text consolidations of their imaginative African geographies allow us to take them as pre uh, and proto-colonial tools for the future perfect cultural subjugation of Africa to the European colonial imagination. By calling these descriptions imaginative geography, uh, geographies, I intentionally recall, and this is the last point, number 20 in your handouts, there are some quotes, I'm intentionally recalling Edward Said's famous formulation of imaginative geographies as potentially arbitrary geographical distinctions that legitimate a universe of representative discourse. Imaginative geographies are, in the word of Mohammed al-Mafedi, a tool of power, a means of controlling and subordinating areas. Or with Derek Gregory, they are profoundly ideological landscape, um, landscapes whose representations of space are entangled with relations of power and which can be said also to constitute a cartography of identities. Imaginative geographies make use of certain representative figures or tropes and in connection to them, they can present prejudice and racialization as fact. Um, I'm wary, however, that this approach runs the risk of flattening the singularity of each text and their ability to craft imagination and reality in unexpected <clears throat> and often surprising ways. For these texts do not function as mere tools of political power and expression, I think, but in their own ability to comment, and often ironically, on their own fictionality, as is the case with, with Seneca, I think that they open potential strategies um, of resignification and perhaps resistance. So thank you very much, and I'm very happy to hear what you have to say. such an amazing range of material. Um, we had a little bit of a, an introduction to one of your authors last week, um, but now it's uh, you know, well, <laughs> followed very nicely. I think um, the audience will agree on, on our presentation um, last week, actually. Um, I don't see any hands up right now. I will encourage some hands up. Um, and, but I will I will take the take the liberty of asking um, a, a a dumb question from a 
a savage who was literally born in a sandstorm in the bank. Um, some things never change. But to, to query, I think that your talk was actually, you dealt enough with the subtleties that to, you know, defy this imaginative geography thing that to some degree, it's not just full imagination, it's exaggeration, shall we say. There's lots mm. of nuances of the imagination. And um, I wonder then if, if I mean, maybe that's where, where your work is going to take us. Is, is it, yes, imaginative was one thing, but maybe the exaggeration gives more of an opportunity for exploitation. Oh, yeah, I remember that. Oh, yeah, I met someone who experienced that. Oh, yeah, that's, you know, mm. things that are based a little bit on on the truth, but seen in the, you know. I think this is a really good point, especially if if it is true, as I think it it may be that there is something particular in the Neuronian period happening with Africa, because mm -hmm. Neuronian literature is all about exaggeration yeah, anyway. Yeah. And, and exaggeration. Nero really believed in the truth. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and exaggeration is also, you know, the superlatives and like the excess yeah, yeah, is also yeah. where they actually find yeah. depending obviously on how you read it, where yeah. you find the irony or the, the the irony which I think goes together with the self-consciousness of these texts of acting as mm. you know as fictionalities in a sense. Mm. So mm. so yeah absolutely it's not as if the sandstorms, you know, or the snakes were in there, but it's just this idea also the the number mm. um of the snake, uh, clearly Lucan when he's like mm. presented the catalog of the snakes, it's not, you know, he, he has his own uh, um, literary predecessors, so he's not kind of acting in a vacuum. Um, but there is something that probably, yeah, that I think is peculiar about the Neuronian age because when we, you know, when we look at Africa, for instance, in Sallust, mm. I don't think we get this sense. We, we, there is something similar. I think Andrew Felder in particular has made very recently a case about the sandstorms in Salus and the shifting of mm -hmm. narrativity, but it, it's very different. Mm -hmm. We don't have this exaggerated. Mm -hmm. So it could be that it's, it's in there that then it gets filtered mm -hmm. to become, yeah, I don't know. But, but it's it's nuanced. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, thank you. As we um, um, wait for the uh, students and the online audience to come up with their own questions, over to Barbara Goff, please. Thank you so much, Elena. That was really fascinating. And I just, if I could just kind of like sort of dig a bit at that question of sort of Africa as the test, the sort of landscape of the test. I mean, that, that seemed like a really interesting thing to be saying, but would we not find that in other contexts, you know, because the whole point of being a soldier is you can go without, you know, like food and drink yeah, and sure. heat and cold and stuff like that. So I just wondered um, if there are sort of specific um, dimensions to Africa that make it a test in that way. And I suppose the other question I was going to ask along those lines, you're making that really good point about the sort of pre-colonial tools, but do not the Romans at some point in your discourse, didn't they kind of fail the test because they were sort of corrupted and Africa was kind of more sort of pure and natural or hard or something. And so I just wondered if that um, sort of like added a wrinkle to your um, to your argument or if it just yeah. goes back again because it just means that Africa is for Romans one way or another. Kind of thing. I, I think you're absolutely right that the same case can be made about other, I suppose that similar cases could be made on Germania, for instance, mm -hmm. or on Scythia. I mean, Scythia from, uh, has a long history, right, of uh, being interpreted, I guess, with our talk, etc., cetera, in, in this way. Um, so that's, yeah, absolutely. I'm interested in, um, well, I think in the Neuronian time, because Africa actually did play, I mean, there is a reality of Africa did playing like such a big part in the, um, in the civil war. And uh, in that sense, where obviously Lucan is, in, is interested in this division, right, within the Romans themselves. Uh, those who actually, as you said, those who fail the test, those who pass the test. And uh, the first time we encounter Africa is actually a character who has switched sides. Um, and, and it's interesting that it's kind of, you know, he's in this, this land of, yeah, uncertain shadows and switching and fickleness, which sort of reflects on the, so I think, I, yeah, I think I've used, 
these are they're all complicated metaphors because I think that the metaphor that I've used the most in my work has always been the you know the one of the mirror or sort of a distorting mirror because I don't think I don't think that any of these that's definitely not Lucan and, and Seneca but I wouldn't say even they are actually actively interested in Africa they're interested in sort of showing you know what Cato book nine is all about Cato actually transforming the party now that Pompey has died into a proper Republican Party. And the place where this can be tested seems to be Africa, but also because historically it was, and that's where Cato will die. So, um, so yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, the, the failing, and obviously then when we get, it's interesting because Caesar is instead, uh, he fails, well, it's not as if Caesar has a test to fail or not to fail, I suppose, uh, but, but the, the characterization of Caesar is instead, uh, runs instead around Egypt um, in the following, well, first on Troy, because in the same book we have, just after the Psyllid, we completely change um, and, and, and we go and meet uh, Caesar in Troy, he's a proto-Alexander, but just, just as Cato has decided not to become Alexander, at the Oasis of Siwa, we actually have Caesar following the footsteps of Alexander the Great, and we will continue to follow him into Egypt there. Um, and, and, and the corruption of Egypt and the decadence of Egypt seems to be directly traced onto the corruption of Rome. So clearly they're not interested. Um, so yeah, I think I'm talking about it as a test in terms of just in terms, I think, of what Seneca and Lucan are doing with Cato's character, I suppose, it's sort of as a stoic, it's a test for stoicism. Uh, whether Cato passes or doesn't pass the test, I think it's up for grabs, though, I suppose. Um, and it has been, yeah, discussed quite a lot. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Fascinating. All right, so it's a follow-up question. I, I, I think well, like Barbara, I'm still pu puzzled by uh, um, uh, by this. Uh, uh, I was also thinking about Africa and, uh, and other provinces. But, but well, uh, uh, when you are thinking about Africa uh, in the mid uh, uh, first century, so uh, we are dealing with a uh, uh, with a province uh, which has been in Roman hands for 200 years, uh, which provides uh, uh, well. Quite an important part uh, of the uh, uh, of the food that the uh, that the city needs, uh, which is highly urbanized, uh, much more densely urbanized than Gaul. Not to think about the Iberian Peninsula, and uh, all that uh, uh, your authors see there are snakes, deserts, <laughs> <laughs> and that's all. So, so uh, I wonder whether they try uh, in any way to well engage with the uh, geographical, social, or economic mm. uh, reality of the time. I mean, Pliny certainly does. He does describe, you know, the Opida Romana quite a length. And I mean, he does seem to make like a his own mosaic mm -hmm. of sources. Um, and then I think, um, or at least part of his source would be the Periplus of Hanno for all these places. So, so there seems to be a clear division between the province, I suppose, and, and the borders. Uh, the, the, the passage that I was thinking, you know, the passage where Pliny, um, the expedition of Nero, is in uncharted territory, but Pliny seems to be a bit more aware, kind of put, you know, putting into the, the military realities. Um, but yeah, I don't know if there seems to be like a division between, you know, the granary that mm -hmm. clearly is uh, parts of, kind of the Roman Africa, not as conceptualized. Um, but yeah, I think Lucan, because we're dealing with this, with, with epic, we don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, right that he, there seems to be an exaggeration of the those characteristics of Africa that serve his purpose there. Um, but even in Epic, I mean, in one thing, it's kind of Africa sort of, one thing that I always think of is because that's what I worked on, but on the representation of Carthage in Epic, when Aeneas arrives in Carthage, there is a very strong feeling, well, apart from the fact that there seems to be a description of the city that is closer to the colony that Augustus um, was founding probably at the time, 
Um, so, so that is, has been much discussed. The description of the city is, is not really the foundation of Dido, uh, but there seems to be the superimposition of the colony on it and a lot of historical irony going there. But we also have the sense of, I don't know, the Carthaginians are compared to bees laboring and, you know, collecting food. We may actually feel a sense of, uh, you know, yeah, this is province actually already working for the Romans for the, mm -hmm. um, it's, no, nothing like explicit, I suppose, but but this aspect may be there. Um, in Sallust, which I didn't I didn't talk about, but we get a clear I mean, we, we get many clear divisions. But one of the clear divisions that he imposes is between the cities on the coast and the mm -hmm. um, and the places in the in the internal. And Jugurta is um, associated very heavily by Sallust with. Um, with the Gaetulians in particular. Um, so so the, there seems to be, so, so they are the ones who are kind of rough because there's, again, there's environmental determinism. They have been tested by the landscape, whereas the cities on the coast um, are the weakest, you know, they're the one that engaged in trade and the kind of thing that we get in Cicero, we also get it um, in Sallust. But in Sallust with the addition that he reports the story that actually um, they were originally, the, the, the inhabitants originally merged with the Persians um, um, who had stranded there. And so the, the Numidians are actually this sort of mixed African autochthonous and Persian people. The further complicates the matter. But there seems to be this distinction, I think, between the coast, coastal area. Um, yeah, and the hinterland. Um, Which attracts the attention, so somehow. Yeah. In a way. But it's, it's, it's in a way like, 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 like in the French, not only French movies about, about uh, you know, Légion, Légion étrangère. So, so, so yeah. what, you, what you can see are not so much the coastal cities, but, but you know, the, the, the scattered forts in the, uh, in the desert uh, uh, attacked uh, by the savage Bedouins. So, Whoever they are. But, yeah, but what I'm interested in is whether there is an actual history of yeah. it. And um, I mean, especially because I'm thinking like, I don't know, if, yeah, if Sam last week talked about this at all, but like there, there is, there seems to be a collection, at least in the representation of Italian colonialism in Africa, which also spread, you know, films, etc., with these texts in particular, mm -hmm. because all the propaganda of Italy was based on these texts. Um, so, so I think that there, there might, at least for the Italian context, but I suppose for the French, um, there is a direct line, I mm -hmm. think, between Sallust, Locan, um, and the Italian colonialism already, like, and the sort of only pre-fascist, but then most obviously during fascist colonialism, all these texts kind of became alive. So, so what I'm wondering about is, yeah, <laughs> what, you know, there is also kind of, I think we can trace some influences as well. Yes, that was truly fascinating. It was great that I had a chance to, you know, um, uh, talk to you before uh, last week. Um, I, I'm very fascinated by the Seneca bit, of course I would be. Um, and that is precisely the, the notorious question is happening at the end of his life and him already having written at the beginning of his life a book on Egypt is very interesting precisely because he might actually in a way be talking to himself when he does those little comments as you've, as you've pointed but also in the notorious question is there's a there's a there seems to be some sort of tension between expansion as well beyond the limits of the known world yeah. uh, in that sometimes he is extremely positive as when he says you know that from Spain to India you can go in just a day's journey in a vessel um, so he's very optimistic with that but then Ethiopia is this kind of world that you cannot really go to and you shouldn't even try in a way that it is you know uh, literally the, the, the underworld it is you know literally uh, uh, Avernus um, so I wanted to, you know, think about that kind of with you, if you, if you, if if you had any kind of further insights into the philosophical and contemporary uh, 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 connotations of precisely this passage around Ethiopia, 
And also, so I have a second question, really, which is kind of really the question. The first one was just thinking of you, which I thought was very interesting. Um, is um, Ethiopia, of course, is both important to uh, Caesar here and to Nero, uh, Caesar in Lucan as kind of the, you know, the origin of the Nile and to Nero. But of course, how, how does it all work when uh, the man who pretended to be the second Caesar, uh, Mussolini, actually finally does take, uh, it, well, has a war with Ethiopia precisely along these lines. What Are there any readings around the moment of Mussolini around these texts and how precisely the, the origins of the Nile kind of work? Or, or, or... I actually don't know. You should really ask some of <laughs> Yeah, I actually, I mean, Sallust for sure, um, Celius and Luke, and I don't know about these texts precisely. That mm. would be, it would be interesting to know. Like, I mean, Mussolini was very well read um, in classics, so it wouldn't surprise me if at, at some point there was something about. But I don't, I can't recall any yeah, yeah, sort of yeah, Mussolini yeah. looking for the, also because of the origins of the night, yeah. So, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't know about, about that or, or a role played by Seneca specifically, but that would be interesting, interesting to look at. Um, regarding the expansion, um, I've been trying to think a little bit about this together with, um, with that article by Harry Ein on sort of kind of, the role of the sage and the role of the emperor within the cosmos, right? For mm -hmm. naturalis questionis. I'm, I'm not really sure that it really helped. I think one, one, one thing that I can see at work here is this, these ideas of the flight of the mind, which um, on the one hand, it's really interesting that there's sort of autoptic experience, especially obviously when he's talking about, about Egypt. And the, that clearly plays a part between his descriptions of Egypt and his characterization of Ethiopia as sort of outside also his, uh, yeah, his, his actual knowledge of it. Um, but, um, but I think that there is a lot, I mean, what I was trying to thinking a little bit farther upon is the ways uh, in which here say, autoptic experience, the knowledge of the philosopher who has, it's no, it, it, it's a knowledge that you, you don't actually need to go there in order to, <laughs> in order to understand. So there's a whole point, right? It's that things happen underwater. You can kind of get there with your mind, which is very fitting for Seneca, you know, and, and the context of writing, of writing the Naturales Questiones. Um, so I was thinking a little, trying to think a little bit harder about these points. And I mean, here in the talk, I try to stress that kind of philosophical knowledge against autop so autoptic experience as the experience of the military. But I think autoptic experience really is the experience of history or the his historiographers. I mean, that all Roman historians, so Professor Levy, et cetera, stress this sense of kind of history as something that has to be seen, right? And also what is the role between that and hearsay and the way in which he narrates this almost historiographical anecdote as if here eavesdropping it from this um, centurions. Yeah. Um, so I, I was thinking about this different, um, which is, doesn't really answer your question, because it's more about kind of expansion and <clears throat> limits, I guess, of testing knowledge of boundaries, which can be, you know, positive as a, I suppose, you know, positive thresholds that exist rather than just, um, and this is this is a time where actually the sources of denial were creating very political boundaries, not epistemological, because um, at least Pliny seems to believe what Juba believed, but Juba probably was telling it in political terms that the sources of the Nile were in Mauritania. Mm -hmm. And in this way, he was sort of closing uh, Africa. So kind of sort of, yeah, mm -hmm. replying to that, to the question of sort of creating a manageable portion of Africa, which also included the granary, so Africa as a granary province, etc and something else beyond it. And this manageable portion was the kind of the Roman portion, but so Seneca must have been aware of that, but he's not following that. Um, he's not really interest, even interested in that. He wants the limits to stay, I think. Mm, yeah, that, yeah. that is what is interesting. He wants to, 
it's fine <laughs> if this is a, you know we don't really have to know um and that there's a danger yes. in crossing it even there's a danger going beyond there is i mean in a sense because this passage is in a clear is in a clear dialogue with another passage of the naturalis questiones that's in book three and that is philip of macedon going into uh, the bowels of a mine and philip of macedon is clearly presented as a hubristic character on the other hand uh, but the similarity between the two passages um, greed and sort of greed for knowledge i think cast a bad light so a hubristic right. light of nero and and, and and argo in the medea of course as well kind of breaking these yeah. world that was yeah. you know all all neat uh, until that was broken and then of course all the problems and it, it's very interesting yeah i mean this is because they're geographical but also kind of going yeah. underground you have yeah. both things at the same time and Tacitus has another anecdote. Tacitus doesn't talk about his expedition, which is very funny, but he talks about Nero wanted to go and look for a Dido buried by, uh, for a treasure buried by Queen Dido in the bowels of a, of a cave. And again, we have this immense as, and again, there's Africa perhaps as a space where we have, yeah, this moment where the threshold is not just on, you know, between it's boundaries are not just between one place or another, but they actually go into the earth, which I, I find really fascinating. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if we have any of that in Germania or the Scythians or other mm -hmm. on other places. Sorry, it's just very interesting. Very, very interesting. Andres. No, no, thank you. Uh, yeah, very fascinating and thought provoking. I also believe that uh, the comment, uh, I mean, Seneca's comment is ironic, especially with the reference to to the tooth and how tooth those stage, you know, I mean, someone who's keen to, to, to hear the tooth who is really important. Let's not forget, I mean, how later the depiction, historical depictions of Nero and how he responded to signs of tooth yeah. uh, <laughs> were actually uh, being taken a note. And I think that it's also, you know, when you flex back to you can and uh, the comment about Caesar and Egypt, and of course, Egypt was really important for Caesar because. Uh, what happened afterwards was that Caesar did something. But I was thinking that all these, um, perhaps you know, I mean, uh, you know better, but uh, more uh, uh, looking from uh, uh, the bigger perspective here, like uh, all these information about Af Africa and this imagined, you know, I mean, depiction of it. Uh, I think. Uh, perhaps I'm wrong, but from what he presented, it relies a lot on the historical and political memory <clears throat> of film, like, you know, I mean, in the past, like uh, 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 what they have experienced and how, you know, I mean, events in the past and how the, uh, they perceive them. And I was wondering, now a very simple question, like uh, whether Hannibal has any place in all this memory, in all this depiction, like, Mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't recall map, but I was, I mean, I remember like Juvenal, of course, out of your scope there, but if you're looking into Pliny, perhaps, like how he's making a reference to Hannibal with regards to Africa again, and how, you know, he conquered Africa as an important part. But just wondering whether Hannibal has played a role uh, and whether his memory has actually affected or influenced uh, uh, the perception of Africa in later times. Yeah, thank you. I think mm. I spent too much time with Hannibal without... Um, I, I've been wondering actually for this project because I've, I've always been like very firm on kind of I'm leaving Egypt out because they are leaving yeah. it out. But I think that with Carthage there is also perhaps something to be said about sort of Carthage as a Phoenician it's been felt obviously Hannibal is felt as African African commander and there are many points of similarities that one could make especially with Jugurta and uh, possibly even I mean especially the kind of Silius rewriting is Hannibal um, also kind of looking at Lucan mm -hmm. I suppose um, it's interesting I think that in Lucan Hannibal seems to be a character who becomes almost more a double for Caesar than uh, than Juba. Uh, so especially in the first book of Lucan, and I, I don't remember exactly, but I mean, there's sort of the crossing of the Rubicon, that there, there are ways in which it is meant to recall 
the um, yeah the descent through from the Alps. Um, and this connection between Hannibal and Caesar has said a long. So that would be interesting that Hannibal seems to kind of somehow, I mean, I may be wrong here, but I think that with in Africa, it's difficult to take it like this because there are so many different people. They have all different connotations. That, that is also part of what I'm trying to do. The, the Nasamones, the Garamantias, the Gaetulians in different authors, are, you know, they have different. But the, the Carthaginians in particular, and um, I think this, especially when you read, when you read Sallust, and he, he gives you this excursus on Africa and all the people, and of course he's interested in Numidia, but he says that he has been reading Punic books. He says, I'm taking this from the Punic books of High Amp, so now we don't know much about what it is that he is um, talking about. And uh, Pomponius Mela is also believed to be um, showing kind of a Phoenician geography. Pliny is basing himself a lot on the Periplus of Hanno. Um, so in my mind, there seems to be a sense that Carthaginians are more, um, not on the Roman side in a sense, but yeah, there is something different about Carthaginians that the Romans kind of, in terms of production of knowledge, they probably felt them more but also in this parallel between Hannibal and Roman commanders, also in Libya, there's, there's plenty that has been written about Hannibal and, and Scipio in particular, um, which continues with Jugurtha and Marius, obviously. Um, but yeah, so I'm not really sure about uh, this for Hannibal, but also for Carthage in general. I'm not really sure how much Carthage plays a role in the kind of things that I'm looking at here. Does, does it make sense? Yeah, yeah. Um, Well, yeah. <laughs> How would we should we interpret Lucan's famous line about Africa knows Plotius Big Cat City? Africa as Africa knows Plotius Big Cat City. Ah, uh, 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 Africa. Ah, uh, yeah, the end of book four. Yeah. Um, so, uh, does that mean that? Um, is there really a hint that Africa has been corrupted by Roman colonialism uh, if they, they got into this sort of slightly ridiculous position of defending Rome against itself? Uh, or um, does it mean that Africa is an inveterate enemy and there's going to be a fourth Punic War? Or um, I've always read it in terms of, um, you know, it would have been, you know, it, would, it, do, it doesn't make sense to be kind of beaten by sort of Roman Romans in Africa, right? Rather than for Lucan, that is a light motif of what we call after Salus Metus Hostilis, right? If um, there is the sense that if we if we keep the idea of this external enemy that is non-Roman, that may save us from the civil war. That is how that is how I read it. So then for him, it becomes paradoxical at the end of book four that we should find civil war in Africa. That's the most paradoxical place where we should find it. But he also reads it as a curse. Um, for instance, there's the, the figure of Metellus Scipio uh, that is a sort of sacrifice uh, to, the, to, to, to the Scipiones. So uh, the, the fact that exactly 100 years after the destruction of Carthage. Uh, this Scipio dies um, is felt by Lucan, and it was probably already felt by Asinius Pollio, though we, we we lost, you know, the work. But it seems very clear that this idea of uh, this is the curse from the Punic Wars. This is these are all sacrificed to the altars of Hannibal and Jugurtha, um, all of these Romans. So there is a sense, I think, that uh, part of what I said, you know, about book. Book nine is that when Pompey dies, because personally I don't think that Lucan, it's not as if, you know, it's not like positive or negative about Pompey, but I guess that without, at the very beginning of book nine, we have the feeling that now that Pompey is dead, um, Cato says it explicitly, now this party can really become the party, the party of, of the Republic. Because up to that point, you know, this was another possible Caesar, another Alexander. So Africa becomes the place where Cato can make it become Africa 
again. So this is a place that is non-Roman. We're taking kind of civil war out and is testing Romanness in Africa. So that is that is part of what happens. But then I think that again that that becomes it's very ironic and look on. Um, partly because Cato is saved by this African people, the Psili. And then actually, if we follow that story a little bit closer, we find out that these Psili were not there, but they had been following Cato for a while. And there is a story of, of the Psili kind of being acting as, at Rome as Roman doctors for money for a very long time. So we sort of find out at the end that, that this place already has Roman corruption after all. Um, but I think that the passage that you're, that you're thinking about, he's playing with this idea that Africa could save us, which is what Mussolini, mm -hmm. right? Uh, that that was the whole point of uh, testing. So I don't know how much we're kind of, I'm reading Lucan through that sort of colonial lens, because that's something that has been done. But, uh, but I think that is something that is in these texts already. Um, I don't think that Lucan believes in it too much, but he's playing with those with those ideas. My, my first, you've ever you've ever spotted any trace of the, uh, the Jewish tradition that the Africans are Canaanites who fled from Joshua. No, so the the on the Canaanite. Um, well, it, it 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 became a an idea among Jews, uh -huh. it? possibly about contemporary with the. Uh, When they were getting to work, worried a bit about how Joshua had treated the Canaanites, uh -huh. the idea that the Canaanites had, had um, withdrawn to North Africa. Okay. I, I suppose that's just a sort of rationalizing of the, uh, or uh, irrationalizing of the story that Carthage was a was a, a Phoenician colony. Yeah. Though you, I, 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 I imagine it has no connection with any other um, tradition or. You've never okay, noticed anything yeah. about, about the Africans as, as Canaanites. Uh, you mean the North Africans? Yeah. Yeah. That's like in, yeah. that's like foundation of Carthage. Yes, yeah. Yeah. So as a, sorry, <laughs> yeah. That, so yeah, as Carthage being founded by a Phoenician Canaanite, sorry, no. Okay, sorry. <laughs> There is mention of an inscription saying, <coughs> "We fled from Joshua the robber." Okay. Um, but I, I, I think it's only a, you know, a fabrication. Okay. Like I'm just asking if you had any hint of any such. Um, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> no. Do you have any other questions from our online audience? You are in house audience. Well, you certainly deserve um, the, the rest and um, hopefully a glass of wine. Please let us return to thanking our speaker for such a great presentation. Thank you so much. <laughs>